Hello dear viewers, it's the 25th of November and that means it's time to review The Witchfinders. The Witchfinders is Joy Wilkinson's debut script for the series and this is a very enjoyable historical. I've been praising the cinematography of these episodes quite a bit of the way through and saying I found some of them a lot more colourful than I did on first broadcast. But the overriding colour tone of this is grey and earthy, but it really fits. As we go around the sort of settlement around Pendle Hill, we have Becca's big house up on the hill, and then everyone else is clustered around in these little sort of hovels or sheds or huts. Over on Flight Through Entirety, we are nearing the end of Series 3 of Doctor Who, and as such, we covered the Shakespeare Code. And I was on that episode along with Conrad, Pete, and Nathan, and we talked about how Doctor Who historicals sometimes present a theme park version of the past. I think it was Pete who came up with that term. And here, instead, I feel we're getting a far more real impression of this past. You know, it is dirty and grimy and grey and there's all this mist around. And I really appreciate that. It gives us an immediate contrast to the environments of Kablam last week, you know, which was industrial and there was an element of greyness there. But even when we were down underneath in the sort of catacombs of the system, it was still sort of gold and metallic, whereas here things are quite dull in terms of colour. In terms of plot, there's a lot going on. And as such, I was rather surprised that this episode is one of the shortest of this series. It's only about 46 minutes long, which isn't much longer than a standard RTD or Moffat episode. And this series, the episode length went up to 50, of course, The Woman Who Fell to Earth was much longer than that, and other episodes have been a bit longer, been a bit shorter. But where I feel that in this episode is, especially travelling between locations, very often we'll get an overdubbed line of ADR to explain why the characters have come here, or just where they are in relation to someone else. The one that really sticks in my head is when the reanimated corpses go back to Becca's house to get the axe, Ryan, Graham and Yaz follow them there. We get a line from Ryan saying we've been all the way through the forest and then back to the house. And I don't know if some extra scenes were cut that would have bridged that gap a bit better or if it was discovered at the editing stage and the extra dialogue recorded in there. It's not quite as egregious as sometimes when it happened in the Peter Capaldi years where the Doctor would explain the plot in ADR. I'm looking at you, lie of the land, but it takes me out of it a bit. I accept that that's a pretty minor complaint for a lot of people. A lot of people don't notice ADR. I notice because I work in television. It's just that to me, it seems strange to have this episode that little bit shorter, where you could have had some extra 20 or 30 second bridging scenes, like that bit where Graham, Ryan and Yaz hear the Doctor about to be dunked, and that explains how they get there. I would have liked a few more of those just to help with the pacing. As for the plot itself, this is pretty standard Doctor Who, and I don't mean that in any sort of way to say it's not inventive or it's not creative, but this is a pretty standard Doctor Who monster of the week kind of thing. And it comes to something when you can say something is standard Doctor Who and it's still as enjoyable as this episode is. The strength of this episode for me is in its guest cast. So we have Becca Savage, played by Siobhan Finneran, we have Willa Twiston, played by Tilly Steele, and of course we have King James, played by Alan Cumming. Willa is our main point of contact in the plot, and I'm also really grateful that Yaz is the main regular who kind of makes contact with her and befriends her. Their scenes together, I really enjoy them. They are two characters of perhaps not a similar age, but I think Willa is around the age of Yaz's sister, so there's a bit of a bond there as well. The temptation, I think, might have been to have Ryan or Graham 
pair up with Willa because, like Willa, they've lost a relative. So I think by using Yaz instead, it gives her something to do. We've been talking about on these reviews how Yaz isn't always terribly well used in the plot. And something I felt last year is that once the Doctor and Willa start talking, Yaz is kind of pushed into the background. But watching it this time, it seems a lot more balanced than that. And also the reason that the Doctor goes with Yaz and Willa is King James's sexism. And that brings us to King James. Look. I have always adored Alan Cumming as an actor ever since I first saw him in Goldeneye as a kid, and I've yet to see him give a bad performance. His King James starts off as sort of camp, Shakespearean level, and when I say Shakespeare, I mean Dean Lennox Kelly Shakespeare in the Shakespeare Code. He starts off as a caricature, you know, the hair on the stamp, if you like, but as the story goes on, we get an idea of how his mind works. And I really like the way that Alan Cumming and Tosin Cole build up a quiet chemistry between each other. King James, of course, is presented as a queer character. I say queer because, in a way, he's presented as a gay character here, but historically he was known to have relationships with women as well. And I remember at the time some people kind of push back against the fact that we have an ostensibly queer or gay character here who also acts in a villainous way, and some people said acts in a predatory way towards Ryan, and again I come back to that comparison with Shakespeare in the Shakespeare Code. And I have to ask, is the way that King James treats Ryan any different to how Shakespeare treated Martha? And I think what is so important here is that while King James is very obviously attracted to Ryan, and he kind of makes no secret of that, the relationship between them is deeper than that. And that moment in the forest where Ryan and King James discuss grief and they discuss the situation of James's life that has made him so paranoid and untrusting it's a standout moment between the actors, but it also tells you why this character is the way he is. And also with that, and it's kind of surprising to come from King James, is his sexism. The Doctor manages to convince Becca using the psychic paper that the Doctor is the Witchfinder General, but it, she can't convince King Charles <laughs> with the psychic paper. It's the moment that the psychic paper can't tell that much of a lie, if you like, or rather King Charles cannot accept that, so he rationalises it. He rationalises that she's the Witchfinder's assistant and not the Witchfinder herself. It's played as a joke initially, and also the Doctor gets those great bits of sarkiness about it, but then it leads the Doctor to go help Yaz and Becca, and we get some great scenes between the three of them investigating the mystery. Again, I think we could have spent maybe a minute or two more figuring that out. And direction-wise, the kind of jump scare of the corpses coming back to life, it's done in long shot. And just look back at the two doctors. You don't want to reveal the monsters in long shot. You want to reveal the monsters in a close-up. You want, you want the jump scare there. And we, we just don't get that. And it's a minor thing. It doesn't affect my enjoyment of the story, but it's more on the second viewing, I kind of think, oh, I wish we'd done that. The other thing that King James not being able to accept a woman in charge leads to is, of course, Becca turning James against the Doctor. And we get such a powerful scene where the Doctor is tied up but talking to King James and begins to convince him that they are equals and she can understand what he's going through, but he shouldn't allow his past experiences to close him off from the world. And it's one of those wonderful moments where it's not just a message for the characters, but it's a good message for real life as well. No matter what trauma you've been through, it's never a good idea to cut yourself off from people who can help, or the world at large. And 
what I love about the scene is King Charles doesn't immediately undo the Doctor's ropes. It takes time for her words to get through. It takes Ryan and Graham and Yaz as well imploring him to set the Doctor free in order to convince him to do the right thing there. If it was sort of in one bound she was free, the scene wouldn't be so satisfying. It creates tension and leads to that really horrible situation where the Doctor's being dunked. And of course the Doctor escapes because the Doctor is the Doctor and can escape from Bonds. But also it makes you wonder why she didn't just escape in that situation where she's tied to the tree. And the only thing I can think of is that this Doctor wants King James to trust her and believe her. She doesn't just want to come in and wrest control of the situation. She wants to work with the people around her. And from the sublime to the ridiculous, I just love that bit where the Doctor says, this would be so much easier if I were still a bloke. Because it's the first time the Doctor has acknowledged that the universe now might be more difficult for her as a woman. And this tension of gender politics in the 17th century ties in with the guest cast themselves. Of the main guest cast, three of them are women. We've got Becca, we've got Willa, and we've got Granny. Now, even though Granny is only herself for a couple of scenes, her existence and character pervade the plot. It was her discovering what happened to Becca that unfortunately led to her demise. Becca's plight of trying to fight off the Morax is what has led to all the deaths in the story. And of course, Willa is given a moment of truth. You know, first of all, sort of her testimony works against the Doctor, but she finds her voice. So if we consider Becca and King James villains in this piece, they are villains who are hubristic. They have a fatal flaw, and that was common in the literature of the period. One of the big examples, of course, Macbeth, which was written around this time. You know, Macbeth is set up at the beginning of that play to be a good man, but his greed and desire for power, and also that of his wife, leads to his downfall. And Becca's greed and pride leads to her downfall, but like Macbeth, takes a lot of people with her. King James has his mistrust and his obsession with finding witches, and incidentally, a lot of people think that Macbeth was written because the king at the time, King James, loved witches, and so Shakespeare wrote him a play with these three witches in there. King James, he's a complex character because he is going around and trying to get rid of these witches, and that was historical fact. King James was obsessed with the idea of getting rid of witches, but King James genuinely believes what he's doing is right. And a lot of villains are like that, but I think James is not set up to be the villain in this story. He is a very damaged person, but he is willing to listen to others. And indeed, there are two witch trials he witnesses in this story, that of Granny and that of the Doctor, and he does step in to intervene on the Doctor's one once he has more knowledge of what is happening. Now, Becca, on the other hand, who is running the witch trials, the main reason she's running them is to distract from her own malady and what she believes is the devil taking control of her body. And she believes that if she purifies the area of witchcraft, then the devil will leave her alone. On the one hand, she believes she is protecting her people by getting rid of these demons. But we, the audience, know that there's no such thing as demons, it's just these aliens trying to take over her. And in killing all these people, she's giving the aliens form. And when she finally succumbs, you feel her fear. She has been a villain not out of self-aggrandizement, but out of self-preservation, and it makes her a tragic and hubristic character. It means that these two characters are not one-note villains, and they're not out to take over the world, they're out to survive, and they're out to protect their world, or at the very least, themselves, out of fear. Not out of a quest or lust for power. It gives them dimension. 
Something that detracts for that a bit with King James, because we've got his attraction and affection for Ryan, which humanises him a bit, but when Alfonso's killed, he barely reacts and he's never mentioned again, and this episode is three or four minutes shorter <laughs> than other episodes in the season. I'm hoping that was in the script and recorded and cut for pacing reasons, maybe the continuity didn't match up, but it's another significant other being killed off in this series without much discussion or reaction afterwards. In modern Doctor Who, if you're going to kill people off, there has to be a reaction to that, which is more than just saying someone's name, which is what happens here. It's unfortunate we could have had reflection on that in the last scene, you know, I wish it hadn't cost Alfonso's life. It's just disappointing to have Alfonso, who is clearly the King's boyfriend, not only someone who doesn't get any character, but is basically mute. I don't remember him saying anything. If he did, it's not very distinctive, <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially when we have three so well-sketched supporting characters already in the plot. It really is noticeable when you have someone who is just there to get killed. Speaking of underdeveloped characters, Oh, the Morax appear at, what, minute 37 of a 46 minute story? And that 46 minutes includes the opening credits, the closing credits, and the next time trailer. Look, they're alien prisoners confined to Earth. They start to escape. They want to take over the Earth. It's all pretty standard. They have a memorable makeup job. The idea of controlling corpses is, of course, always scary. And it fits in with the almost Halloween atmosphere we have going here. Uh, it's kind of a shame this wasn't the Halloween episode, although Arachnids in the UK basically was and that worked. But uh, once they escape, they go back into their tomb. We do have the visual of the queer king being bent over a tree stump, about to be um, <clears throat> overtaken by a tendril from another king. Just saying. The Witchfinders, in the end, I give 8 out of 10. It's a very enjoyable historical story. It's well designed. It looks great, even though it looks so dull in terms of colour. That is a sign of really good direction and really good cinematography. The performances are generally very good. There are a couple of underdeveloped elements, but given that the story is about human mistrust, I can kind of understand why the monsters are pushed into the background. It's another strong story in a series and a doctor who have found their feet pretty quickly, in my opinion. Do come back tomorrow when I'll be saying something nice about another Doctor Who episode, but until then, thank you very much for watching.